In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at how spontaneity for a reaction can change under non-standard conditions. In particular, we'll examine the effect of concentration on the Gibbs free energy change of a reaction. To understand non-standard conditions, first let's examine standard conditions in a little more depth. Let's do so by looking at the spontaneity of a simple process under standard conditions. The process we'll examine is one we've looked at before, the phase change of liquid water into a gas. Using standard thermodynamic values, we can calculate the change in Gibbs free energy for this process as the difference in the Gibbs free energy of formation of the products minus the reactants. And we can look up these reference values for Gibbs free energy of formation in the appendix of your textbook. There are one coefficients on both the reactants and the products. So our formula for this process is simply subtracting the value for our product, gaseous water, and our reactant liquid water. And we get positive 8.59 kilojoules per mole. And we know that a positive Gibbs free energy change for a process indicates that it is non-spontaneous. And the degree subscript on that Gibbs free energy further qualifies this as at standard conditions. But what does that mean? At this point, you should be able to answer that standard thermodynamic conditions represent a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. It also indicates that all gases in the reaction have a partial pressure of one atmosphere, and all solutions have a concentration of one mole per liter. Finally, all liquids and solids in the reaction are in their most stable form. So in this situation, standard conditions mean that at 25 degrees, and a partial pressure of one atmosphere for water vapor, water does not spontaneously go from the liquid to the gas phase. Does this fit with our experiences though? We do know that water doesn't go through full scale boiling at 25 degrees, but is that the only way water can go from the liquid phase to the gas phase? Think about a puddle on the sidewalk. Eventually that puddle will dry up. The water in it will evaporate from the liquid phase into the gas phase, the process described here. So how can this happen? It's not because the sun heats the puddle to the boiling temperature of water. Evaporation occurs well below 100 degrees Celsius. The critical difference here is not the temperature, but the vapor pressure or concentration of water in the atmosphere. Puddles evaporate on dry, on dry days, and on a typical dry day, the vapor pressure of water in the atmosphere is 0 0.005 atmospheres, well below the standard condition of one atmosphere of partial pressure for gases. So ordinary conditions are not usually standard conditions. The standard Gibbs free energy that we calculate using reference values only applies to that one specific temperature and when all the reactants and products are in their standard states. Most importantly for solutions and gases, that means one mole per liter concentration and one atmosphere partial pressure. And if those aren't the conditions for the system you're studying, then the standard Gibbs free energy with the degree sign will not necessarily predict the spontaneity of the process. We can, however, factor in differences in concentration and pressure by using reaction quotients. So under non-standard conditions, we can calculate the Gibbs free energy change as the standard Gibbs free energy change with the degree sign plus R, which is the ideal gas constant in units of joules per mole Kelvin times temperature in Kelvin times the natural log of Q. And remember that Q is the reaction quotient for any reversible process. And that's just the equilibrium expression with whatever the actual concentration or pressures of the system are substituted in. Let's look at the evaporation of water again. And this time we'll factor in the actual vapor pressure of water on a dry day, 5.00 times 10 to the negative three atmospheres. 
And we know that the Gibbs free energy change will be the standard we calculated from the reference values plus R times T times the natural log of Q for this process. And the standard Gibbs free energy will still be the reference Gibbs free energy for the products minus the reactants or positive 8.59 kilojoules per mole. We do need to convert this into joules per mole to match the units in the gas constant R, and we'll also convert our temperature into Kelvin. Finally, we need to calculate the reaction quotient Q. So since this process involves gases, we'll calculate Q using partial pressures. And as you know, equilibrium expressions are usually products over reactants. In this process, our reactant is a pure liquid, though, and is not included in the expression. As a result, the expression we use for calculating Q just becomes the partial pressure of the gaseous water. Technically, it's over 1 for our pure liquid reactant, but we can just write this as the value of the partial pressure of the water. We can now substitute these values into our equation for delta G. And we can plug this calculation straight into our calculator. And we find that with a vapor pressure of only 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 for water in air on a dry day, we get a negative value for delta G. So the evaporation of water on a dry day at room temperature is actually a spontaneous process. It turns out that as long as the reaction quotient Q is less than the equilibrium constant value, K, the Gibbs free energy for the system, will be negative. And this means that the forward reaction will be spontaneous. In contrast, the reverse reaction will be considered non-spontaneous. And we've already learned that when Q is less than K, the reaction shifts towards the products. And now we see that same relationship in terms of the change in Gibbs free energy. Reactants are consumed and products made in the spontaneous forward reaction. We also know that when Q is greater than K, the system will shift towards the reactants to the left. In other words, the products will be consumed and the reactants produced until the chemical system reaches equilibrium. In terms of the Gibbs free energy change for the system, when Q is greater than K, the delta G value will be positive, reflecting a non-spontaneous forward reaction and a spontaneous reversible one. And finally, when Q is equal to K, the system is at equilibrium. Neither the forward or the reverse process is favored over the other, and as a result, we reach steady state concentrations. In this situation, our Gibbs free energy change is equal to zero. This last situation is an important one. We can substitute these values at equilibrium into our expression for delta G at non-standard conditions to derive a new relationship between standard Gibbs free energy change and the equilibrium constant of any reversible chemical reaction. If we rearrange this to get the standard Gibbs free energy change on its own, we find that the standard delta G for any process is equal to the negative of the ideal gas constant times temperature in units of Kelvin times the natural log of the equilibrium constant K. Alternatively, we can solve for the equilibrium constant K by rearranging and K then will be equal to Euler's constant E raised to an exponent that consists of the negative of the standard Gibbs free energy change divided by R divided by T. And we can use these last two equations to solve for the standard Gibbs free energy if we know the equilibrium constant for a process. Alternatively, we can predict the equilibrium constant for any process if we know its standard Gibbs free energy change. 
For example, we can calculate the equilibrium constant K at 25 degrees Celsius for the synthesis of ammonia gas as long as we know that the standard delta G value for this process is negative 33.3 kilojoules per mole. So to solve, we'll use this variation of our Gibbs free energy formula. We'll have to convert our standard delta G value from kilojoules per mole into joules per mole to match the units in our gas constant. We'll also have to convert our temperature into units of Kelvin. Then we can substitute our values in and simplify the exponent term, plug this into the calculator, to get 13.4338. We can then enter E raised to the 13.4338 in the calculator and it gives 6.83 times 10 to the fifth for the equilibrium constant. And this is huge, indicating that the products are much more abundant at equilibrium than reactants for this process. In other words, the forward reaction is strongly favored over the reverse. In summary, for non-standard conditions, Gibbs free energy changes can be calculated as the non-standard delta G value equals the standard Gibbs free energy change for the process plus R, the ideal gas constant, times T, temperature in units of Kelvin, times the natural log of Q, which is the reaction quotient for this particular process. At equilibrium, we know that the Gibbs free energy will equal zero and that Q equals K. And this allows us to relate the standard Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant K as follows. Standard Gibbs free energy equals the negative of R times T times the natural log of K. Or rearranged, this can also be K equals Euler's constant E raised to an exponent that is the negative of the standard Gibbs free energy change divided by R divided by T.